Good evening, friends, and welcome to our Wednesday night Vesper service. This week we're focusing on study and studying scripture. And tonight's service is going to have a lot of focus on that. We're going to hear from some of our children in the church, and we're also going to hear from some of our adults and talking about the, the importance of studying scripture and how it impacts their lives. Hamilton talks a little bit about how we can experience God uh, through general revelation or natural revelation out in the world. We can look around and, and know and catch a glimpse of the divine presence. But Hamilton also tells us and reminds us that it's in Scripture, in the stories of our faith, where we experience God. And so let us enter into that story tonight. One of my favorite stories is the Good Samaritan. One day, a man was walking down the road. People had stolen his money and he was badly hurt. A person passed by and ignored him. Later, another person passed by and ignored him too. Then, a Samaritan passed by. He was known as the Good Samaritan. He helped the man and took him to a motel to safety. My favorite story is Revelations in the end. This is because in the end, Jesus and his army of angels throw Satan into the fiery furnace. And then behind that part of the story, there is a part when Jesus comes to the door, knocks on it, and we ask who's there. And then he says, come, your time is near. We go with him, and we always be with him forever. My favorite Bible story is when Jesus was born, because I like all the animals, and I like animals, and I think the manger is pretty, and it's good to have a new king. My favorite story is Noah and the Ark, and today I'm going to read you Noah and the Ark, the ending. 
Then Noah sent a dove, and then the dove came back with an olive branch. And so what did that mean? It meant that the flood was over and there was land. Awesome. My favorite story is Genesis. Why is it your favorite story? Because I, because I know it. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Praise the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their host by the breath of his mouth. He gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle. He put the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe before him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. I've been asked to talk to you today about the importance of study in your Christian walk. And to do so, I want you to consider a question. You ever wonder how cults come into existence? Um, you know, what uh, led people to extremist views um, that society wouldn't otherwise accept? And typically it starts with a charismatic leader who speaks some truths that are consistent through humankind, um, who makes you feel good about yourself and others. And then through that slippery slope, next thing you know, you're supporting extreme uh, views that you probably otherwise wouldn't support uh, without having all those elements in there. And so the question is, why are we as Christians any different? Uh, we have charismatic leaders, uh, Jesus and Paul and uh, many of the patriarchs of the Old Testament. Um, they speak truths. Um, they make us feel good oftentimes in what they're saying and who we are. In my opinion, what separates us um, from that cultish uh, feel is our scriptures, our text. Um, we have a holy scripture that has many authors, not just one, but numerous authors writing over a period of 2,000 years. And in those texts, um, what makes our text different from many other religions, because other religions have texts just like ours and other more voluminous and uh, wise sayings, um, what makes our text so much different is the presence of prophecy that is there, that is fulfilled in our Savior and our Messiah, Jesus. Prophecy that's 400, 1,000, or even older years old that has come true. And how is it that we learn those things? Well, we learn it through study. It's through studying this text that we can see um, the actions of mankind, these prophecies that are uh, told, and the fulfillment of those prophecies. And, you know, it's fine to have those things told to you, but it takes it to a whole nother level when you take the time to open the Bible, read the text for yourself, considering the historical context in which it's said, learning about that history, and, and through that and through reading and making your own decisions, it helps you to focus more um, 
and, and get it more ingrained into your life. And it uh, benefits you because you're more, if you're doing that studying yourself, you're more likely to apply it in your own life as opposed to if you do nothing more but listen uh, to the word. And you may have some concern that, you know, Brian, you know, we don't, I don't know that I really, I want to study, but I don't know that I really want to critically think about it because I don't want to put God to the test. And I, I get that. But God also tells us, um, you know, to test his word. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, he said, Do not scoff prophecy, but test everything that is said. Um, you know, through my life, I have come to the Bible with an open mind. Um, I wasn't convinced or not convinced of it when I started reading it. And through it, uh, through critical examination throughout my life, even as an attorney, the Bible has passed every test um, that I have put to it. Do I understand it all? No, not, not even close. But as I get into it, as I read it, as I consider here historical con context in which it's said, I get a better understanding of the people in it, why they said what they said, and how it stays consistent. Um, the Word of God stays consistent all the way through Genesis from uh, Revelations. And that consistency um, breeds credibility. And so, yes, I love feeling good when I worship, and that makes me feel nice. But it's through the study of these prophecies that are fulfilled in Jesus Christ that the credibility of the Christian religion really hits home to me. You know, uh, an often ignored passage in Acts, uh, chapter 17, uh, talks about uh, people who lived in Berea. It says, uh, and those people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonia, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas uh, were teaching the truth. As a result, many Jews believed, as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. So they didn't simply, there in Berea, accepted the word of Paul. They studied this, you know, the word. Is it consistent with what they understood God's message to be? And it was. And through that, they came to know God and Jesus. So, you know, worship is important. Prayer is important. But just as important is uh, the study. Um, uh, through it, it breeds your credibility. So when you speak, you can speak with authority. You can, can speak with conviction. And you can speak persuasively in a way that when people hear you, they will want to come to know Christ as that their Messiah. And that is the ultimate goal. So I encourage you, study the word. Put it to the test. If God is who you and I believe he is, the word will pass that test. Amen. Hi, Jeff Bruce asked me if I would share a little bit with you about Bible study and what it means to me. I am a procrastinator of great proportions and a keeper of good intentions. So even though I have had different attempts at Bible study all my life, they have gotten much more consistent and much more powerful over the last few years. Now, part of that is the fact that time at home during the pandemic left me no excuse to say, well, I don't have time. And I guess that could be said for a lot of us. But the single most important thing that has led me to better Bible study has been the groups that I've been in. Those different groups have helped me be accountable to not just have that good intention, but to make it a reality. I know I was part of Jeff's Disciples group. I had a wonderful time with my small group and the larger group when we did the quest during Lent a few years ago. But the number one thing that has me getting into my Bible has been my Sunday school class. 
And I think many of us at First Christian love our Sunday school classes, and I am no different than, than you all. Byron and Susie Lucas's class focuses on Bible study. And we did a book whereby we went through the entire Bible, called Through the Bible in 52 Weeks. Well, actually, it was Through the Bible in One Year. It took us a lot more than one year, but that's because we spent so much time talking about it. The groups gave me structure, and I needed structure, and I needed accountability because it was just too easy for me to have the good intention and then not follow through with it. The groups have been important for accountability and also for just learning so much from what everyone's opinions were and how everybody felt about a verse. We all get different things out of Bible study when we read. And so sharing those certainly gives you some light bulb moments. Daily devotionals are also part of what I do. And I use a little book that many people use called Jesus Calling. Now it may just have anywhere from two to four verses a day that go along with the reading. But if we're trying to get to five verses a day, that's a really good start. And sometimes it only takes a couple of paragraphs to make you realize something profound. In addition to learning so much more about the Bible and how the God's love and the covenants from the Old Testament really are a foundation for what happens in the New Testament and how all these things interweave. One of the most important aha moments I had is that through the consistency in reading it several times, I realized that God's abundant love and grace that he has exhibited all through the Bible was not just for the people mentioned on the page. It was for me. The more you read the Bible, I think the more you may be like me that you realize this isn't about somebody else. This isn't a story for someone else. It is for me and for you. So when you hear all those wonderful things about how God loves his children, he loves me. He loves you. And as long as we keep our eyes on him, you can feel like you are wrapped in his love, just like a big warm blanket. It's easy, and it was very easy for me, to fall into the trap of thinking, well, what's my self-worth? And you look over and see what other people think of you, or what you think they think of you. You look at yourself and say, well, I'm just not worthy of all this. And the ultimate realization is that while none of us are worthy, God loves us all. And when you start reading the Bible and you put loves me in whatever word they use, it becomes so much more than a book that you study. It is God talking to you. So I appreciate you letting me share this. And I hope you have a really good time going home and opening your Bible somewhere and hearing God speak to you.
institution of the Lord's Supper is found in Scripture in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. In this letter, Paul gives us a pattern with which to remember this holy and sacred meal. He writes these words, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also. After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul found it important to recall and remember and retell the new covenant that Jesus offers his followers. It is important for us living 2,000 years later to recall and remember and retell this story. The beauty of scripture is that it gives us something to embody. In this book are the words, the stories, the hopes, and the prayers. And when we read and share and spend time with God's word, we begin to embody what these words and stories and promises and prayers mean. One way we do that is through sharing the Lord's Supper together. It is embedded in scripture and it is lived out in and through us. What a gift. Let us pray. Gracious God, God of word and deed, you give us gifts so great we can hardly fathom. You give us gifts of holy and inspired words and stories, laws and prayers. You give us the gifts of interpretation and study. You give us the gifts of community and friends. And most of all, Lord, you give us gifts of life. Blessed life that we know and can share because of Jesus Christ. May this meal strengthen us empower us, comfort us, and guide us as we strive to be your people in this world. We offer you our hearts as we continue along this walk with Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.